So with this upcoming fight, guys, we got Roger Hilly and Raul Garcia Jr. What can you guys tell us about these two? Well, I, I actually spent a little bit of time with Garcia. You know, he's another guy. He's a pro MMA fighter. Um, he's 3-1 and one out of Oklahoma City. Uh, comes out of a gym with some other pro fighters. Uh, there's a, a girl I think is going to be in his corner. I believe she fights for Bellator and had a fight last week. And I was told Garcia is 3-0 uh, as an amateur. So, uh, again, you know, guy has a little bit of boxing experience. He's a professional MMA fighter. Uh, it'll come down to it. I'm, I'm, what type of punching he has. Uh, well, I, I have no doubt that he's a very tough guy. But, again, it's uh, two different animals. Um, Hilly's 4-0 with three knockouts and is, is a local guy. So, we'll, we'll see what Garcia has. You know what? Uh, at the end of the day, you know, all it takes is one punch. We, we know. We've seen it. We, you know. Heart, determination, you know, it's not the size of the, 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 the line in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the line. We all know that that's the truth. Absolutely. That's one of the most beautiful things about the sport of boxing. That when you compare it to other sports, you know, there could be a guy down and out, looks like he's done for and all it takes. You're exactly right, Michael. It just takes that one punch. You, you know, I always, always, th always think back in my childhood, Weaver Tate. John Tate, heavyweight champion from Knoxville, Tennessee, WBA champion, dominating the fight, heading into the 15th round. Mike Lieber lands that one big left hook, and John Tate's life was never the same. My favorite fight was, what was it, uh, uh, George Foreman when he dropped Michael Moore? No, they, when he dropped that guy seven times, and the guy dropped him seven times. What was his Ron name? Lyle. Ron, Ron Lyle. Lyle. Oh, that is Lyle. one of the greatest Lyle. fights ever. One of the best fights of all time. That's my favorite heavyweight fight of all time. I tell you, another good one was Michael Moore and Burt Cooper. Oh, yeah. Burt Cooper each other in the four rounds. Well, Burt Cooper had yep. no neck. <laughs> yep. His shoulders was holding up his head. <laughs> All right, guys, we're going to be joined here. Um, congratulations on the win. Terrence Ice-T Reed. Terrence, you're going to be uh, joining us here. Fresh out of the ring right into the interview booth. Terrence, congratulations on your victory, first and foremost. Um, one thing we noticed out there is you were very patient, almost unusually patient, especially for a young fighter, guy who's in his first fight facing the nerves. Is that something you specifically train for, to, to have that type of patience? No, I actually train my kids to do that. I'm, I'm also a, a trainer of two. My son and daughter are ranked number one in the country. Wow. So, my son is in preparation for the 2020 Olympics. I train, I do this on the daily, you know. For me to preach it, I have to show it exactly. while they're here, you know what I'm saying? Being composed in the fight is very important. You know what, Ice-T, I must say, that, that was a sweet performance. I, I had Thank a play you. on the name, but um, you know what? Tell us a little bit about your amateur background. Specifically, I was curious, because again, you look like an experienced guy. You were very poised in there, and a lot of the things you showed are traits that usually guys in their pro debut don't have. You threw straight punches, you threw smart punches, you didn't waste any energy. So uh, tell us a little bit about your amateur background and maybe some of your experience you had, maybe even in the gym. Well, my amateur background was, was, wasn't was big at all. I only had 35 fights. I was 35 and 5, okay? As a kid, my parents didn't support this boxing. They didn't support this sport. So I was sneaking to the gym at 10, 11 years old. You know what I mean? I was sneaking to, to Ripley, Tennessee, which is 10 minutes away from where I stay with, with strangers just to get to the gym. So. Beautiful. Beautiful. So, you know, uh, yeah, congratulations on the victory. You know, when, when can we expect to see you again? Man, whenever whenever Matt give me another fight, man, I'm in it. Yeah, I don't, I don't care if it's tomorrow. I, I want to be here. <laughs> All right. Sweet victory for Terrence Ice-T Reed. Congratulations, Thank Terrence. You. Thank, you. The pros. Terrence. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Great job. Ladies and gentlemen, from your third fight tonight, we have a super lightweight four-round bout. That's what fighters now. Jesse Bryant will be your referee in the blue corner. Yeah. Fighting out of Norman, Norman, Oklahoma, by way of Oklahoma City, weighing in at 136.2 pounds. Here we go, guys. Raw, bad guy, Garcia! Raul Garcia Jr., here we go. His opponent, in the red corner, fighting out of Chattanooga, Tennessee, with a weight of 137 pounds, Roger the Hitman Hillary! Roger has 200 amateur fights, really? Wow. Again, I, I, we will we will reflect to our uh, local expert on this, David. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about Roger's background here in just a second? Uh, no, I got this. Yeah, no, yeah. I, don't, I don't have it. <laughs> Look, the, you know, David's the expert when it comes down to amateur careers. So we'll let we'll let him talk about that in a, in a minute here, because David right now is. Uh, um, Quenching his thirst. <laughs> so let's uh, let's talk about this fight. What do you think? Uh, who do you think uh, 
shows more promise between these two fighters right now? You know, uh, just on paper, you got to say Hilly. You know, he's a natural boxer. He's got the amateur experience. You know, again, Garcia had four, three professional, three amateur fights as a boxer. He has four pro MMA fights. So, just on that alone, you look for it. But ooh, switch. oh, he just switched switch up. stance. No, well, no. see, the only thing, the only problem I had with that switch stance is that he didn't step back. He actually switched stance in place. So, if you get caught with a punch while you switch your stance in the same area that you're standing, you're off balance. You're going to go down. Yeah, not a lot of guys do it. Not a lot of guys do it well. Uh, to me, the guy who is the absolute master at switching stances and not getting hit while he's switching or being in a bad spot is Terrence Crawford. Is the uh, absolute best at that. The but best, that's the best. But arguably the pound for pound best fighter in the world right now. I mean, I was at the weigh-ins last night and I saw I saw Garcia and I saw and and, I, and I, everybody everybody there, not only me, uh, saw a look of concern, a, a look of uh, uh, intimidation in his eyes. And when I spoke to him uh, later on that day after the weigh-in, he seemed very more like more composed like he had a game plan that he could stick to you know my my, uh, my old friend another box in life for John Scully always says you know that the most nervous times are not in the ring it's it's the way in it's the training camp it's the weight to get in the fight is, is what really kills you so you know what as a pro debut you know again it's a different animal uh, you know fighting a guy who's 4-0 with three knockouts as a pro and as a, as a deep amateur background as a local kid so you know what there, there's definitely a lot of nerves and you know now I guess is, uh, is when he hopes to work those out yeah, exactly. Well, see, you know, when you fight in the South Pole, I mean, you can all agree. When you're fighting the South Pole, it's it, you know a lot of fighters that are orthodox fighters have a have a problem fighting South Pole because they don't know how to adjust. In reality, all you really have to do is gain the outside leg. If you get your left leg outside that right lead, you can drop your right hand all day long. The problem is a lot of fighters don't feel confident doing that, and and therefore they have so much problems fighting the South Pole. Yeah, it, it's always been a problem. You know, I, I always ooh. Ooh, looks like he's stunned. I always kind of say it's like, you know, you, you, you go to, um, you know, you go somewhere where they drive on the opposite side of the road. It's opposite side, you know, so you have to step the opposite way that you're used to. So if you have a righty against a righty, you know, even a lefty against a lefty, it's, it's the opposite stance. So it, it's definitely something you have to work on. And uh, <laughs> you know what? There, there's a reason that a lot of these these guys, even at the top level, don't say, you know what? I'm dying to fight a southpaw. Well, you <laughs> it's know, definitely it's, a challenge. It's you know, no, no one's rushing to fight a southpaw. Because Tevin Farber from Philadelphia is actually in Australia right now with Minnie and Gibson yeah. and all them. And she was actually mentioning today on Facebook that, you know, she didn't know they drove on the other side. She forgot they drove on the other side of the road. I had that problem when I, I went to uh, the Cayman Islands, you know, which is a British island. I had the same thing. It, 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 I kept having to turn onto the wrong side of the road, and maybe the first 10 or 15 times, I was nervous a car was going to come slamming into me, but it, it, it didn't happen. So, yeah, you know, it's uh, it's definitely definitely different fighting. Absolutely. Absolutely. David, fill us in, baby. What do you think? Well, I think uh, I think the hitman is... is uh a little bit better this round, a little bit uh, cleaner, more effective. Ooh, see. big, big, it hurts, big! Really hurt right. to see it toward the end of the round. He looks, uh, he looks like he throws really sharp, effective punches. I, well, I thought I'm giving that round 10-9. Yeah, for sure. Um, the thing that I noticed. Hilly, again, kind of like the last fight, he's not throwing a ton of punches, he's throwing strong punches, and he, he buzzed him a little bit a couple times, ran out of time in that round, but I, I think the thing from Hilly is, you want to follow up a little bit, he, he's, he's the more solid fighter, he's, he's a stronger guy, and again, he's landing, he's hurting him, so if I'm Hilly, I'm, I'm looking to maybe put a, uh, you know, a couple punches together and see what he's able to do off of that. The problem was the, the one I the what I was seeing what I was seeing right there was, you know, if you're fighting a southpaw, all right, and the southpaw is getting off his right hooks, right? That's those are check right hooks, by the way, and he's dropping his left straight hand. You're going to be in a heap of trouble all night long. Yeah, he also has to know, you know, again, he also has to know to look for that, you know, which again, some of these younger guys don't know to look for those veteran boxing tricks, the uh, Mike Melendez School of Boxing. <laughs> <laughs> For uh, Garcia, what kind of adjustments does he got to make right now? If I'm Garcia, you know, I'm looking again. I'm looking to try to find those openings, and I'm calming the nerves a little bit because you look in his hands and you look at his body. He's very tight on his punches. Like, he's throwing a lot of punches, but you could just tell he's very, very tense. Well, he's not following through either. He's, yeah. uh, he's actually shortening up his punches to the point where he's not following through with his punches. He, when you're boxing, it's just like Bruce Lee used to say. You do not punch at the target. You punch through the target, you know? And I almost feel like he's switching stances and might not even realize it. It's like he's moving from left to right, and it's, it's almost not strategic. It's almost like he just happens to maybe fight both ways. Um, it's something I just kind of caught about him. 
Uh, we'll see next time he switches here. Which well, way do you think he's more effective, orthodox or southpaw? I think that's still to be determined. No, I would actually stay orthodox because you can never fight a southpaw in a southpaw game if you're not a southpaw. <laughs> you know, I would actually say stay orthodox, gain the le gain the initiative on the outside. If you can get your left foot outside that right foot lead and drop that straight right hand, you stand a better chance at winning a fight than you do fighting a southpaw in a southpaw stance. Yeah. These are, uh, these are actually both our first two lightweights we have here tonight as well. So what are some of the differences you see in some of these lightweights versus some of the bigger guys? Well, they tend to throw a lot more punches. They tend to be far more active. Um, oftentimes, they tend to be better conditioned fighters because they have to make a uh, much more stringent weight limit. And uh, it's really high volume punching. Yeah, you know, it, it's more of, you know, more of a, a combination of speed and you know, technique where a lot of the bigger guys you look, you know, you look for knockouts. And I mean, even with with some of the top heavyweights, you look at them. You, the first thing you think is this guy is a huge puncher. And even the the smaller guys that can punch, there's not a lot of lighter guys that are that are throwing only a couple punches and, and just looking for the knockout only. So it, it's definitely the, like you said, the conditioning, the number of punches you have to throw, and and the, and the style and, and pace you have to keep up uh, against smaller guys. I've always said one of the toughest fights I ever had to judge was a strawweight fight. <laughs> uh, the strawweight. I mean, that's the low, lightest division. <laughs> Kept throwing punch punches. <laughs> you, you, you really couldn't discern any damage done with most of the punches. It was very difficult. Tonight, actually, main event, uh, UBF championship, Mike. Uh, we have local kid Edwin Reyes, is a 108-pounder from Nashville, is fighting against Jesus Soler from Puerto Rico. That's going to be a good one. Uh, very familiar Jesus with Reyes. Reyes. He's a local fighter. Fought, his amateur career fought here. Very, very active fighter. Never in a boring fight. Always comes forward, presses the action, throws a lot of body punches. Uh, sometimes uh, his technique is not the greatest, but in his last fight he showed, showed great improvement. He will come to fight. Well, not only that, if you look at the standings right now in the rankings in box rec, you'll see that even though he's 8-3-2 and, 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 and Soler is 9-1, and one, he has a higher ranking because of the actual opposition he has faced. Yeah. I know one of his losses came against Damian Sugar Vasquez, who's, who's one of the good young American prospects in the lower weight classes. So, And Edwin's a fighter. You know, I spoke to him. I spoke with Matt Young. You know, the, the kid loves to fight. You know, he's, he's a fighter, nice as could be outside of the ring, but, yes, you know, comes in there, throws a lot of punches, and, and TriStar Boxing is, is dubbed him as the world's most exciting fighter. So we'll, uh, I'm definitely looking forward to that. And you know. Mike, Michael, before the action tonight, we were talking about Soler, and this is actually his first fight outside of Puerto Rico here tonight. So that, I'm sure that's something that, uh, that'll definitely affect him as here tonight. Oh, absolutely. You know, everybody says it's easy, but it's not. You know, I actually traveled for the first time outside the United States when I was eight years old. I went to Puerto Rico. That's the reason why I got into boxing, that I got my butt kicked a lot. <laughs> so yes. so you, 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 when you travel outside your normal, your, your norm, what your comfort, your comfort zone, it's going to bring out another beast in you. You either going to perform very, very well, or you're going to be very, very disappointed. I think, you know, I, by talking to this fighter and talking to these people and knowing his people, I think this is going to be the best fight of the night. Yeah, you know, like I said, you know, we, he was talking about all the punches thrown by the smaller guys, <laughs> and this is the, the second lightest weight class. You know, you have one guy, again, who's already known as the most exciting fighter in the world in, in Reyes, and you have another guy's 9-1, and one, you know, another exciting fighter, and he's coming in here, and he has to out-punch an active puncher and do it in front of his hometown crowd. So that that is definitely going to be a, a, a great fight, and uh, if anyone's keeping track of the punches... Oh, great, a great right hook. Them, yeah. A lot of punches will be thrown in there. You know, if you carry the moniker Hitman, you've got to bring it in the ring, don't you, Matt? No. Thomas Hearns, Ricky Hatton. You know, yeah, certain <laughs> nicknames, you know, you, you bring a lot in. And it, it's funny, you know, sometimes the nickname doesn't fit the fighter. You know, Johan Guzman was a great boxer. He had the nickname uh, Mini Tyson, did not fit him. Ruslan Chagayev uh, was White Tyson. It was not a big knockout. Jerry puncher, Cooney, so, you know, great white hope. Great white hope. Well, a <laughs> little, little different, but, you know. <laughs> oh, you went there. But, yeah, you know, it, when you have certain nicknames, you have certain standards you're supposed to live up to. So, you know, we, we, will, we will see if he lives up to that. So, you know, but, again, Ray is, Ray is excited. You know, this is his hometown. You know, he's a kid that's traveled. And, you know, being a, a much lower weight class fighter, it's not always easy to find those lower weight class fights, especially in the United States. So he's a kid that, that's happy to be at home, happy to have his people here. And, you know, this is, this is his second time fighting for a title. Uh, he did drop a decision against Damon Vasquez, who's, again, who's a good young fighter uh, out on the West Coast. So this is, uh, this is a very big fight for Edwin, and then it's a big fight for Soler as well, because I'm sure he's looking to another go another back to thing. Uh, another thing with Edwin is, I think this is his fourth or fifth fight that he's going to be in since December or so, I believe. Yeah. 
Yeah. Activists. Well, see, activists well, doesn't really help you all the time. I mean, if you look at Pritchard Colon, Pritchard Colon fought a lot of fights. And I'm talking tough, tough battles, one after another. And a lot of people like, like, oh, you, you should you should slow down. You should not, you know. And I think he was on the right track. I just think that, you know, he was just a victim of circumstance. You know, I, I, I think the man could have been a world champion without a doubt in my mind. He could have been a world champion. Um, uh, last time I was in Puerto Rico at, a, a, at one of their fights, I actually took a picture with him because, you know, I consider him one of my cousins. We, his name is Richard Colon Melendez. My name is Michael Melendez. We hung out together. He hung out with me and my family. So he is like, I love him to death. You know, the man was very humble. Very So, you know, at the end of the day, this is what it boils down to. It's that, you know, what do you bring to the table at that night? You know, because you can be the best fighter in the world. But you can have personal problems at home, too. You don't know what's going on in a man's life, you know? That is true. You know, and, and the Pritchard Cologne situation was very unfortunate. You know, T Terrell Williams didn't fight. I don't know if he's had his first fight back yet. You know, that was that was a very unfortunate situation with, with rabbit punches. You know, the, the referee didn't do the best job either. And you know what? You, you just hope that Pritchard's able to get back because the couple times I spoke with him before is... is Unfortunate injuries. A really nice kid. People say great things about him, and nobody you know, wants it's, to see uh, that from it's, nobody. That's what I'm saying. You know, when 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 you hear about these fighters, sometimes trying to get as much money as possible. Uh, I'll say one thing that stuck out to me. You mentioned the name earlier, Tevin Farmer. Put out a tweet one time, and it, and it really stuck with me. It, you know, I mean, he pretty much said, "Get as much as you can, as quickly as you can. This doesn't last forever, and it's not safe to last forever." And I just thought about that. Exactly. You know, it's and, true. And, and look, I've been guilty. You know, we, we've criticized guys for money grabs. You know, taking the least risky fight. You know, at the same time, you know, we're going to criticize if a fighter gets hurt. You know, like the whole Magomed situation. Magomed's in a bad spot. You know, people are blaming John David Jackson. People blame the commission. And right, again, those right, are those are valid right. concerns. But it's like at the same time, we also criticize guys for having money grabbed. Well, this, everybody this, complained this, about Mayweather you know, yeah. taking a fight with McGregor. You know, listen, you're about to make the most money you've ever made in your career. You would not, you know, you'd be crazy not to want to do it. I mean, personally. Well, it's almost like this, you know, again, and I understand, you know, the, the fan in you wants to see you fight the best from the business side. You look at it as like, well, you know what? I could have the world's easiest job and I could be a multimillionaire doing a job that's very easy for me. But you as know a what? regular person, you know what? I'd take it and so would you. You know what I would do right now? I would just say, you know, say Hey, you know, well, you know what, Mayweather, you want to do another fight with uh, McGregor? Let's do it MMA style. Get in the octagon. Let's see what happens then, you know? I don't think that's going to happen, you know, and, and that, that, that's, a whole different, that's a whole different animal. So, back inside the square circuit, we had a knockdown in the last round. Yep. Uh, Hilly is, is definitely taking this fight over again. He's, he's got a game opponent, an unorthodox opponent, but a guy who just does go. not have the boxing experience, and that's that's becoming more and more evident. No, the, the, the sad thing about it is when he when he actually getting tagged, he's dropping his punch, he's dropping his guard. See right there. Yep. He dropped his guard the minute he got hit. Watch again. There you go. He got hit, dropped his guard. You can't do that in boxing. Yeah, he's not Cassius Marcellus Clay. He needs to keep his left hand up, right? Exactly. Or and Muhammad Ali. Up. <laughs> <laughs> well, now he's now see that's what he needs to do. Garcia needs to start working that body. Work that body. Put the pressure on him. Don't give the man the distance. He needs to put the power on you. Right. If you can't outbox somebody, brawl with him. Brawl with him. Yes. And if, you know, if if, if if all else fails, whatever you're doing now is not working. Change it. You know, there's a fight in 1980 between the uh, first fight. There we go. What Strong left hand. Left, left. It's really imposing hand. his will in this fight, isn't he, Hillary? Well, I, I think I think the fact that you know he just dropped his hand. The man saw him drop it. He just dropped. He gonna drop the left hand and put it away. And I think it was more balanced than it was pain. I don't think he really hurt him. I think it was more balanced than pain. And the man was squared up when he got punched. Got some blood coming out of the nose of Garcia right now. He got tagged pretty good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Got I mean, the doctor look at him. Tap. You can flick somebody in the forehead and get him a nosebleed. <laughs> you know, and again, in a weird way, if this fight's going to continue, you know, again, it's an advantage for the fighter that got knocked down. You know, obviously, he doesn't want this to happen, but usually, you know, if you don't get up before the count of 10, the fight's over. But he no, got up and he gets a little, you know. See, but normally you don't stop the action for a nosebleed. Yep. I, I see agree. a cut, you know, maybe a busted lip, but you don't stop before a nosebleed? Come on. I, no, I agree. I agree. I don't, I don't think I've ever seen. You I've know, never a, seen a, a nosebleed. Stop with a nosebleed. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I've seen my kids got nosebleeds and when they were three or four years old. I didn't know, hey, hey, what happened? Yeah. <laughs> no. Could it be the referee just thinks he's taking too much punishment? Well, I don't no. think so. No, because, I don't think that was yeah. the case. Because, you know, usually what they'll do is, you know, they'll have the doctor come and take a look at him. A lot of times it's between rounds, you know, he'll move the finger back and forth. I think that was just maybe 
you know, they, they had them clean it up. Um, but it, it definitely was an advantage for him. But I don't know how much of an advantage as it looks like Hilly's getting ready wow, to Wow, left hook right hand. Off. I do got to hand it to Garcia as well, though, for going as far as he has in this fight. Absolutely. He's got hard. He's Can't tough. take that away from him. You see, the only problem I see with Garcia's technique right now is he's not turning his punches. Like, when you throw a right hand, you want to turn your knee in the direction of your opponent. You know what I'm saying? You want to drop your right hand dead center on your opponent. You don't want to turn it where it's too much or too little because you're taking either away or too much under the punch. And I'm sure that, that might be something that kind of stems from that MMA background, would you not say that? Yeah, and, and Hilly's just a lot sharper, you know. It, 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 kind of like the last fight. Almost every punch that Hilly throws, oh, he stopped it. Stoppage. Yeah, it was yeah. gonna happen. It was bound to happen. Yeah, it, kind of an interesting stoppage point. You know, I, I don't know if I agree with the stoppage there, but it, it was well, kind of evident that that's the way the fight was gonna go. Um, I didn't so. agree with the stoppage when it was a bloody nose either. So yeah, th there's definitely a talent gap in that fight. Yeah, yeah for we sure, knew for that. Sure. Hillary was that. just a far superior fighter. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. But you know what? At, at the end of the day, Garcia did come to fight. He didn't lay down. Once he got hit and knocked out, he didn't stay there, you know, expecting to get a payday. This is the kind of fights you want to see in boxing. And that's one thing about Matt Young's TriStar Boxing. They, they put fighters that come to fight on their, on their fight cards. Yes, they do. And you know what? So far, we've had three very interesting fights. Yeah. You know, for sure. We, uh, we did have exciting fights. And you know what? We're... Uh David, I know you, you double as a judge. Uh, the judges are yet to have to be in uh, effect tonight as everything has been stopped. Every fight has been stopped, so no judges scorecards quite yet. <laughs> yes, but at some point in the evening, as you know, we'll probably have something go to the scorecards, and you just never know. What did Larry Merchant call boxing? The theater of the unexpected. Here's the official particulars. We have a TKO in the fourth. Two, two minutes and 22 seconds in the fourth round for your winner. Right there, right there. It's, really, it's really exciting to see young fighters develop earlier in their career and then see how they progress as they move on, isn't it, Matt? It is, you know, and then what I was saying before, you, you were tied up, but you know, I definitely I could definitely tell, you know, I did want to know a little bit more about, about Hilly's amateur background, but he um, he impressed me, you know, he, he was very poised and he has some skills, you can tell he's got uh, some athletics, athleticism as well, so as a local guy, what do, what do you know about his amateur career? I don't know that much about his amateur career, no, I, I don't, but he looked impressive in the ring today. Yeah, for sure. You know, again, we'll, we'll, another guy will see him as he keeps moving up, stepping up, you know, now he's 5-0, and 4 knockouts. Um, again, no, no, no disrespect to his opponent, uh, Garcia was definitely outmatched tonight. Um, Hilly, you know, I'd like to see him against a guy with a little bit more pro experience, even if it's an upside down record, you know, maybe a guy who's a little bit durable and will make him work for it. That, that to me is where you learn a lot about these young fighters when they, when they fight a, a tough experienced veteran guy who's been in hard fights, lost some close decisions, doesn't, you know, typically get knocked out. That, that's, a, that's a real good test uh, for a prospect in my eyes. Absolutely, and I think it was you that said earlier the best fight you ever saw was a four-rounder. So, a lot of don't snooze on the four-rounders. Uh, Chris Murphy against Abe Torres in 2009, Schutzen Park, North Bergen, New Jersey, uh, pound for pound promotions. That was the best fight I ever attended in terms of action in the ring. <laughs> so I'm still thinking back to my childhood days on ESPN, Caveman Lee and John LeCicero. Yep, I don't kill each other. <laughs> But like I said, you know, some some of the forgotten about fights are ones that weren't really seen. You know, are, are ones that were exciting. So.